Hi, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on veterinary insights from across Canada. My name is Stacey Domalewski. I'm the Research and Innovation Coordinator for the Beef Cattle Research Council, and I'm going to be your moderator for tonight. Our session tonight should last for approximately one hour, but it could go a little longer depending on the number of questions you have during the question and answer period at the end of tonight. If you're on Twitter, I would encourage you to tweet along with us using hashtag beefwebinar. We are recording the session, and I'll email out a link to watch the recording to everyone that's registered within the next couple of days. So if you miss anything tonight, uh, you can watch it again, or you can pass it along to someone who you think would find it valuable. Of course, you'll go, you are going to be able to hear and see tonight's presenters, but we're not able to hear and see you. So if you do want to communicate with us, there is a chat, panel, a chat screen on your control panel. There's also a Q&A box. If at any point during today's webinar you have questions for any of our panelists, please type them into the Q&A box. We will answer them all at the end of the webinar, but feel free to send them in as we go along um, so you remember what your questions are. If your internet connection is being a bit slow tonight, it can be helpful to either turn off anything else that's using internet, such as external servers, things like that, or close the webcam videos, that, or webcam windows, sorry. That means you're not going to be able to see our presenters tonight, but it should make the audio come through a little clearer and the slides load a bit, little bit better for you. So with that, let's get started. So here's what you're going, we'll be covering tonight. Uh, you're going to hear from four vets on today's webinar with each of them will be talking about something that they deal with as veterinarians and then we'll open it up to Q&A at the end of the session. So with that, let's get started. I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker for the night, Lisa Fries. She's a provincial veterinarian with the government of New Brunswick. She grew up on a dairy farm in rural New Brunswick and attended Nova Scotia Agriculture College in Truro, and then Atlantic Veterinary College in Charlottetown, PEI. She's been working for the New Brunswick Department of Agriculture since 2006 and is still active with her family's dairy farm as well as her in-laws cow-calf operations. Hi everyone. So like Stacy said, uh, my name is Lisa Fries and I work for the Department of Agriculture. Um, and the main reason I chose this topic is because I have found over the last several years that um, a lot of the time we're dealing with calf scours in Atlantic Canada and our weather seems to be changing quite a bit lately. And we have a lot of variable weather. So it might be very snowy and cold today. We might have freezing rain next day. And calves are having a really hard time adjusting to all that changing. And farmers are also having a really hard time trying to keep um, their yards clean as a result of some of these weather changes. So I thought I would talk a little bit about calf scours and just a little bit about causes and prevention and treatment and hopefully it helps people deal with their own problems. So the complicated thing about calf scours is that there are multiple different causes and there's absolutely no way that you can look at a calf or your vet can look at a calf or look at the manure and say exactly what is causing that diarrhea. So there's kind of three main groups of bugs that cause diarrhea, the first one being bacteria and probably the most common ones we see in this group is E. coli. Um, Clostridial uh, disease is probably second and occasionally in some areas salmonella can be an issue as well. Uh, the second group of bugs that we commonly see are viruses and probably the most common out of that group would be rotavirus and coronavirus. And the third group of bugs is a group of parasites and probably cryptosporidium and coccidia are the most common of that group. Uh, all of these bugs can cause disease at varying ages in the calf and sometimes the age that your calf gets sick will give you an idea of what bugs might be involved but oftentimes when one bug is affecting a calf um, some of the other bugs can kind of take advantage 
of that calf's immune system being occupied with another problem, and they can also cause secondary problems at the same time. So because it's very complicated to figure out which uh, bug you are dealing with, there are really only two ways that you can figure this out. Um, probably the easiest way is to take a manure sample from a scouring calf. And it's really, really important that you take this sample before you treat the calf with any antibiotics. If you've already treated a calf with antibiotics, then the result that you get from a fecal sample might be a false result. You might have been dealing with a problem that your antibiotic has already dealt with, and you might be missing something by uh, checking a treated calf. So it's very important that you take that sample before you treat an, a calf, you put it in a nice clean container, and you keep it in the refrigerator and until you can deliver it to your veterinarian. And the fresher the sample that you get to your vet, the better. The second way that you can do um, some sampling and figure out what problem is, is unfortunately doing a post-mortem on a calf that has died. If you have scours problems and you have calves that are dying, doing post-mortems and having your vet send some samples from those post-mortems are a very useful way to get a lot more information about what you're dealing with. So the main reason why we do these samples is that they will tell your vet whether you're dealing with a virus, a bacteria, a parasite, or like I said, a combination of all of the above. And the most useful part about getting that information is it can help you in preventing future cases of scours. Is there a vaccine that you might be able to use? And if so, which vaccine? Because the vaccines don't cover all of the potential problems which antibiotics might be useful for you to use, or are any antibiotics useful for you to use? And if so, which one might be the most helpful? That's a really pe uh, valuable piece of information that your vet can get from doing a pretty simple fecal sample. So the first thing we'll talk about a little bit is prevention. And the biggest thing in prevention is a clean environment for your calves. So obviously if you have a calf like in the upper picture and it's born into that nice big bed of straw and it doesn't see much manure, it's going to have a much better chance of coming through the first few weeks of life without catching scours. Um, the more manure a calf is exposed to, the more likelihood it's probably going to come down with scours because all of those bugs are passed from animal to animal in manure. So you can have it passed from older calves to younger calves as your calving season moves on. So the more frequently you can clean your calving areas and your creep areas and the cleaner you can keep your cows so that your calves aren't having to nurse really dirty udders like the picture below, the less chance you have of your calves developing scours. The second key for prevention uh, can be vaccination. And this is one that you can do after you have already figured out what the cause of diarrhea is on your farm. Vaccines do not cover all of those bugs, regardless of which, which vaccine you are using. And vaccines are not like a magic bubble that, that protects the calf from all causes of diarrhea. They definitely help make cases of diarrhea worse. They help a calf fight off the disease easier. Um, but it's not going to bounce off all the bugs just like a bubble would. So there's a couple different ways you can vaccinate your herd. Uh, the first one would be to vaccinate your pregnant cows. The only thing about this vaccine, um, this type of vaccine, is they wear off very quickly. So you have to vaccinate your cows late in their pregnancy um, for it to have of any value. Um, and you still have to make sure the calf gets colostrum because the cow isn't passing a whole lot of antibodies to the calf while it's in utero. So it's still really important that you make sure that calf gets colostrum. The second type of vaccine are a few different vaccines that you can give to newborn calves. And just like colostrum, the earlier that this, the calves get these type of vaccines, the better they tend to work. Uh, the only thing to remember with these is obviously they are not replacing colostrum either. 
So you still have to make sure that your calves are getting colostrum. And when we talk about colostrum, there's several dis different sources of colostrum that you might be able to use. The best one typically is from a calf's own mother, but obviously sometimes we deal with calves that don't have any milk or don't have enough milk, in which case you can substitute colostrum from another cow on your farm. You can substitute powdered colostrum. There are various powdered colostrum products out there. The only thing you do have to make sure is, is the product you're using a complete replacement, which means that that calf will be perfectly fine if it gets zero other colostrum other than that package of powder, or is it a supplement, which means that your calf is still supposed to receive some sort of colostrum from the cow, or it probably needs multiple packages of that product in order to completely replace the antibodies it would get from its mother. And if you look on the label of whatever product you're using, it will tell you whether it's a replacement or whether it's a supplement. So it's just one thing to be aware of whether your one bag is enough, whether several bags need to be used to make sure your calf gets the best start it can. You can also use frozen colostrum from um, a, another animal on your farm and frozen colostrum can be kept in the freezer for up to a year. You do have to make sure that when you're thawing it, it's a slow thaw, that it's not in hot, hot water because you are going to cook the antibodies that are in that colostrum. Uh, you also can't microwave it. Microwave will also uh, kill all those good antibodies that you're doing your best to get into a calf. Um, in Dar's situation, some people also will travel to the dairy farm down the road and see if they have any colostrum because they typically do have some. The only thing to remember is that colostrum from another farm doesn't necessarily have the same bugs in it that are on your farm. And if it's not clean colostrum, you could also be importing disease onto your own property and feeding that dirty colostrum to your calf, which could make it ill. So it's just uh, one thing to kind of keep in mind if you are having to get some colostrum from another source. So next we're gonna talk a little bit about treatment. And the main thing that I try to uh, tell clients is the most important thing is lots of fluids. And fluids are far more important than any needle or any pill that you can give a calf. Um, in, in any case of scours, fluids are the most important thing because they're losing so much fluid out the back end, you have to replace it in the front. And the good thing about fluids is that even if you were treating a perfectly healthy calf without scours with electrolytes, you are never going to hurt anybody. So, you know, even if you're not sure, is this calf still nursing enough? Is it not? You can give them electrolytes and, and be okay in the fact that you're not going to hurt them, even if they were already getting enough milk from their mother. So in a regular day, a calf will probably drink, uh, you know, between 10 and 15 liters from its mother. And so if it's passing a lot of fluid out in its manure, you have to replace a fair amount of fluid to get that into the calf. And so we probably break that up into between one and three feedings of electrolytes every day, uh, so long as a calf is scouring. And the big thing is, is that you should never take a calf completely off milk or milk replacer. Electrolytes alone don't have enough fat in them to keep a calf energized and to keep them going. So usually what I try to get clients to do is if they're feeding electrolytes, you alternate between one feeding of electrolytes and one feeding of milk or milk replacer. And if the calf is still nursing off the cow and feeling good enough to be up and doing that, that's great. You can just substitute electrolytes a few times a day and know that the calf is still nursing its mother. If you are not sure whether it's nursing or it won't nurse off a bottle, then tube feeding is sometimes necessary. And if you're not comfortable doing that, ask your vet. They can very easily train you how to do that so that you can do it safely um, and so that you can eliminate the risk of potentially drowning a calf. The other thing to remember is that although treating a calf with oral fluids is a 
little bit of a pain for the farmer to do. Um, it is far easier to treat them early in the disease with oral fluids than it is to have to treat them with IV fluids later when the calf is in much worse condition and is that much harder to get back to health. The second kind of staple of treatment is um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications or NSAIDs. And what these drugs do is they help to decrease a fever if your calf has one. They help to decrease the amount of inflammation in the gut. And they help make your calf feel better so that hopefully it will want to get up and nurse more often. And because there are several uh, options when it comes to NSAID type medications, uh, you should probably talk to your vet about what the best option is for your farm. There are a few side effects of uh, overusing NSAIDs, so you really don't want to overdo it or have prolonged use for any animal, but your vet can help you decide uh, which the best medication is and how long of a course to treat every calf. The second treatment that a lot of people commonly use is antibiotics and the big thing to remember about this is that it is only useful in cases where bacteria is the cause of the scours. If it is caused by a virus or it is caused by a parasite, uh, antibiotics will have no effect whatsoever. And the, the other thing about antibiotics is that if you did the testing that we talked about at the beginning, your vet can always tell you which antibiotics are the best ones to use for your calves, given the particular bacteria you're dealing with on your farm. And that antibiotic might not be the same as the one that they've recommended for your neighbor, because it might be a different bacteria that you're dealing with, or it could be the same bacteria, but it just responds differently to certain antibiotics. So kind of in summary, my, my big take home messages are clean environment will limit or eliminate a lot of cases of scours. The cleaner you can keep those calves, the drier you can keep those calves, the less the chance that they will develop scours. Colostrum is the second one, and uh, somebody else in this presentation is gonna give you a little bit more information on colostrum coming up, so we'll leave that to him. The next one is make sure you take a manure sample, and doing that is before you treat with antibiotics. Very, very important. The next one is fluids and more fluids and more fluids. Really, really important that you're treating calves with fluids. And there are several electrolyte formulations you can talk to your vet about what might be the best one to use on your farm, but um, the, the key is frequency and volume for sure. And my final recommendation is to talk to your veterinarian. Uh, if you are having a scours outbreak, uh, your vet can help you a lot, whether it's in doing samples, whether it's in doing postmortems if necessary, uh, and they can help you with a lot of advice that you might not think of on your own. So they're definitely a valuable resource. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Lisa. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, if you have any questions for Lisa, I've seen some come in already, but if you type into that Q&A box on your screen, um, you can send in your questions that way and I will read them all out at the end of the hour. Uh, with that, I'll introduce our next speaker, Max Littlejohn. Dr. Littlejohn grew up on a pig and grain farm in Elling Country, Ontario, where he graduated Ontario Veterinary College in 2002 and started working for St. Mary's Veterinary Clinic. Shortly after, um, Max's main area of interest is implementing economic, practical, herd-specific preventative medicine protocols, including vaccinations and nutrition programs. And Max, I'll get you to turn on your webcam. There we go.
Do I, Stacy, am I turning on my own PowerPoint here or are you pulling it up? Yeah, so at the bottom you should have a little share box. Well, there it is, yep. I see it now. There we go, and you can pick your PowerPoint. There we go. Thanks, Stacy. Perfect. Oh, I guess I should start from the start. Thanks, Stacy. Yeah, as Stacy mentioned, um, these are uh, these are the three passions in my life: my family, uh, the vet clinic. Um, it's in, out of Kirkton, Ontario, which is a small hamlet uh, north of London, about two hours west of Toronto, and about two hours northeast of um, Detroit, Michigan. In southwestern Ontario, and um, and the third one, of course, is why we're all here is uh, beef cattle. So, um, what I'm going to talk about tonight is uh, what we've seen in Ontario over the last few years: um, pink eye infections. I'm going to talk specifically about a pink eye infection that I've had in the Hereford herd for the last few years, and I may have more. Uh, we may have more questions and answers, and uh, may some something that the BCRC can. Uh, investigate further and then I'm going to talk about uh, digital dermatitis in the feedlots that we have in Ontario because it seems to be cropping up uh, more and more all the time. So first we're going to start with, with pink eye. Um, as you can see in the picture um, there's different stages of pink eye and this is sort of an early pink eye in a Hereford and we've got a, a, uh, a nice tearing eye. Now this herd that I dealt with as a purebred herd, and we had a pink eye outbreak three years in a row. Um, the interesting thing about this outbreak is that they share a pasture with a red Angus herd, and that herd had little to no pink eye. Not only that, but they did not vaccinate against it and uh, had very little fly control with the Angus herd. Um, the pink eye that we were getting responded nicely to long-acting oxytetracycline, and uh, we also would put an intramammary antibiotic up right on the eye. So after the first year, before the second summer, we uh, decided to do a very intense fly control program. We put insecticide ear tags in each ear. We vaccinated the herd with a MaxiGuard vaccine, which is a pink eye vaccine against M. bovis or Maraxilla bovis, that's the name of the bacteria. Um, strains that cause pink eye. However, during that uh, early pasture season, June and the first May, end of May to the first of July, we had greater than 30% clinical infection rate. Um, during that season, we cultured the eyes again, and we cultured a, uh, a bacteria in the same, somewhat of the same family, but a different strain known as Maraxilla bovoculi. So the following year, we again vaccinated with MaxiGuard and we pulled a uh, vaccine that is only available in the States called a M. bovoculi bacterin. And we brought that in by an emergency drug release. So they were vaccinated with both types of vaccines. Uh, same poron uh, insecticide treatments, insecticide ear tags, um, and still, not much of a significant change in the clinical disease rate um, in the third year. So the biggest issue with pink eye, and I'm sure uh, anybody that has pink eye can relate to, it's a very multifactorial disease, and certain things can set animals, uh, it predispose them to it or protect them from it. We're dealing with a Hereford animal, so the breed predilection there is a uh, non-pigmented skin around the eye, which is a problem there. Um, sunlight can be a stressor, which is why you see some calves with a big uh, eye patch over their eye. Flies is a huge problem, and that's typically how the, the, uh, the disease is transferred from beast to beast. Um, however, we did a very good job um, on this farm with fly control. Uh, we find that weather, um, wet springs followed by bouts of dry, uh, uh, times in Ontario seem to build up fly numbers and then the flies just sort of migrate to any moisture they can get and of course there's moisture on the eyes 
as well. Um, pastures, we always recommend that pastures should be clipped to keep the uh, to keep the awns from the grasses down, so that there's no accidental scratching of the cornea and allowing um, any bacteria to get in there and causing more problems. So um, the typical treatment that we've been using, like I said, was uh, injectable long-acting tetracycline, and we also added on some uh, on some more serious ones. We also added a, an antibiotic right to the cornea or the, the globe of the eye. Um, the biggest questions that I have that we need to answer is why is the neighboring or the, the, the neighboring herd on the shared pasture? Why were they not affected? Um, should commercial uh, commercially available vaccines have both the M bovis and the M bovoculi in them? And another question I ask myself is that we're giving these vaccines um, parenterally, which typically means in the muscle or in the skin. And should they be given by an alternate route? Because um, the blood supply of the eye is very different from the blood supply to other organs. And maybe this is not the best route um, that we should be giving this vaccine. Um, so things to think about, but uh, fly control is important and uh, catching it early and using uh, antibiotics, uh, both long acting oxytetracycline and if you have available and get some available, some uh, intramammary antibiotics that dairy farmers would use um, work well because they're in the shoot anyway. Let's put some antibiotic right on the right on the cornea of the eye. The next topic I'd like to talk about that we're seeing more in Ontario is digital dermatitis. This condition has many names: hairy heel wart, strawberry foot, raspberry heel, and there's multiple other ones as well. It's a, a disease that's caused by a bacteria called treponema um, and it, what it does is it gets into the superficial layers of the skin typically behind the uh, on the back of the foot typically is where it starts behind the hoof uh, just above the hairline and it uh, it can cause severe lameness and it is very contagious um, and it's primarily seen in confined cattle so dairy, dairy cattle have had this problem for quite a while, um, but we seem to be in the, in the research and in the uh, population investigations and feedlots, we're finding it more and more all the time, and it's cropping up here in Ontario as well. Some health records from uh, Western Canada uh, revealed that almost 450,000 uh, head, and of those, of the number of animals, um, lameness affected over 6% of them. But of those 450,000 head accounted, the lameness accounted for 28% of all treatments and nearly half of all euthanasia. So lameness is a huge issue when it comes to uh, livestock. And if we can prevent it and prevent euthanasias and uh, because they're costly and it's a huge investment when you buy these animals into a feedlot, to have to put them down is, uh, is not economical. So if we can prevent it, it's always better. And uh, the, the animal welfare, the animal welfare implications are also huge. So in Ontario, there is, has been an increase of digital dermatitis seen in the last few years. We see it more often in higher numbers in pack barns versus slatted barns. And that's essentially just because of the amount of manure that is around the foot. In slatted floor barns, for those out west, um, it's essentially like a pig barn where the manure is, is pushed through a slat into an underground pit. The manure is not allowed to um, rise up to the rise up further up the leg and uh, soften the skin above the claws and allow the bacteria to get into the uh, underneath the, the skin. We can see, we've seen it in multiple pens in one barn. We've seen it in multiple barns on a farm. And typically when the animal is uh, lame, comes up lame, they're usually heavier and uh, are usually over that 1,200 pound uh, weight. And if you watch them, I, I had a video um, on my phone, but it was lost and I couldn't transfer it over here. But I've, it's typically the ones we see, the ones I've seen, they almost walk, they're, it's like they're walking on their tippy toe. They want to get that heel of their foot right off from touching anything else because it's so tender and raw 
they walk right up on their tippy toe and pull the heel of their foot right off the ground. So if you can imagine that. Again, here's a here's a picture of a of a pack barn. Uh, now this barn has an outside yard as well as an inside pack, but you can see the amount of manure that's in there, and that's just asking for for uh, spread of infection from one animal to the next. And the you can see on the, the animals that we can actually see the feed on that the the slop and the manure is up above the dew claws. Versus on the bottom picture there, we have a, a picture of a very nice slatted floor barn. Uh, the animals are fairly clean and there is no manure buildup. You can still see the slats. And uh, so the amount of manure that is able to slide up um, onto the skin of the foot will be very minimal. So to help control digital dermatitis, uh, foot baths is ideal. However, in feedlots, it's not very practical. Um, if it's possible for you to do it, that is the best way to do it. Um, using a copper sulfate, a zinc sulfate, or formaldehyde. And if if you're if you are a feedlot producer and you have discovered that you've got digital dermatitis, it's very important that if it's in a pen, let's try and keep it in that pen and not move it elsewhere. And if it's in a barn, let's try and keep it in that barn and not move it elsewhere. So let's visit the dirty pens or the dirty barns last, and let's try and disinfect or change boots when leaving that. Uh, leaving that barn um, so that you're not uh, carrying it into the next a, a pen or a barn that's not been infected. The most important thing is to keep manure build up to a minimum. So both both Lisa and, and my talk so far have talked about cleanliness. Um, let's try and keep manure build up to a minimum, whether it's calf scales or in a feedlot and you're dealing with digital dermatitis. These bacteria don't prefer oxygen, so if you can keep the if you can keep the animal's hooves clean and dry, uh, you'll go a long way to controlling the spread. You also have to remember that this bug, the treponema uh, bug, is uh, once it's in the animal's foot, the animal will always have that infection. But there are certain stages of the disease that can flare up um, and cause problems again. So the goal is to get it into the dormant stage and keep it there. And you can do that with uh, with better bedding and, um, and uh, foot baths, etc. So there's a, there's a picture of a nice pack barn, not very highly stocked, I realize that, but um, the nice thing about it is that we've got beautiful dry straw, the animals are clean, and um, low amount of manure able to slide up to that foot. The treatment, typically when these animals are lame, you've got to get them into the chute. You have to determine whether it's a, a, a classic foot rot or a digital dermatitis or some other form of lameness. If you discover that, yes, it is a digital dermatitis, you need to clean the manure off. And I typically use a, a, a very stiff bristled brush with some soapy water, clean it off, and then I, we apply any, either a copper hoof treatment or oxytetracycline paste. Um, if there's any swelling in the tissue around or on the foot or up the leg, um, you should talk to your veterinarian because you, you could be getting what's called a secondary cellulitis or an infection underneath the skin is traveling up a little further. So this would be a very severe digital dermatitis lesion causing uh, a secondary uh, infection on top of that. And then you want to move it to a nice dry pen for a few days, either for so that you can pull it again and retreat it or uh, just allow it to dry out and get it into that dormant stage. Uh, in Ontario, in our, our pack barns, the ones that we can scrape, typically what we do, if we've had a pen that's been uh, infected or had in digital dermatitis in it, we scrape it out and we let, we let the manure residue dry. We then apply, uh, cover the form with uh, large amounts of lime, and that helps um, change the pH. The bacteria don't prefer that, and we can kill some off that way. And then you throw your, your uh, straw or your bedding on top of that. It's very hard to do, of course, in a, uh, in a packed barn that uh, has a dirt bottom because uh, it's harder to clean out, and it's harder to get the uh, nice contact of the line to the floor 
And of course, it's also harder to do in a slotted floor bottom because the amount, there's going to be a quite a bit of line that's going to go through the slots. So at that, I will uh, say thank you and move on to the next speaker. All right, thank you very much. And once again, if anybody has questions for Mac, you can just put them in the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen and we will answer them all at the end of the hour today. So with that, I will introduce our next speaker, Craig Doran. Uh, Dr. Doran received his DVM from the Western College of Veterinary Medicine in 1985. In 1998, he joined Veterinary Agri-Health Services where he has been a managing partner for the past 13 years. Areas of interest for Dr. Doran include growth promotions, beef cattle welfare, development of training programs for producers as, and staff. Thanks, Stacy. I'm just um, working to share. My, have you got my screen there? Um, we're seeing, there we go. Okay, there, are we good to go? Good to go. All right. So thank you very much. Um, so what I want to talk to everybody about today is the most important day in a calf's life, and that's the first day. So what I hope to is give you a few tips on getting a calf started right in life. And some of the research that I'm going to show you today is um, done from my partner, Dr. Elizabeth Homerowski. And she did this during her master's graduate research at the University of Calgary uh, Veterinary College. So the three areas we're going to discuss is uh, resusc resuscitation of newborn calves, uh, doing a vigor assessment on newborn calves, and then we're going to follow up on what Lisa talked about earlier, and that is uh, making sure calves get adequate colostrum. So for calf resuscitation, when calves are first born, and especially it's been a difficult pull or a cesarean section or something, one of the things we're always concerned about is making sure that they get started breathing properly. And their traditional way of doing this was to hang the calf over a fence, and we would watch the fluid drain out of its mouth, and we would all talk about how we were clearing the airways. And we were pretty much doing exactly the wrong thing in that procedure. We now know that um, the fluid that was coming out of the mouth was coming from the stomach, not from the lungs. And by hanging calves upside down, all we're doing is putting the abdominal contents, pressuring the diaphragm and actually making it more difficult to breathe and making it more difficult for that calf to uh, take its first few breaths. So the proper way to deal with a calf when you are trying to get it breathing properly is to put it on its chest in sternal recumbency uh, frog leg it so that the legs are going forward and that um, stabilizes it uh, upright and that allows both lung fields to aerate equally. If you are concerned that the calf's not breathing properly, there's a few different things that you can do. One is you can pour cold water on the calf to get a gas reflex and, and get respiration started. Um, we can also stimulate respirations by rubbing the chest and that's what mother cows do when they lick their calves shortly after they're born. Um, the most common way, I think, and it's what I do usually when I'm involved in a calving with a cow, is I'll take a piece of straw and put it up a calf's nostril, and usually that'll cause them to shake their head and, uh, and take a big breath and start breathing. But if you're not happy that any of those procedures are working properly, you can get a little more scientific, and there is a, an acupuncture point in the middle of the nose between the two nostrils as indicated by this red X on this calf. And you can take a small uh, eight, or a 20 gauge needle by one inch and insert that into there and uh, rotate that needle slowly. And that can stimulate respiration in a newborn calf. So a lot of uh, Elizabeth's research was on, the new, on calf viability uh, shortly after birth, and she developed a vigor assessment tool. And so th the things that can reduce vigor in calves are calves that are, are hypothermic when they're born in cold weather, um, acidotic because they didn't get enough, and hypoxia, which um, they don't get enough oxygen at birth, 
uh, trauma from a difficult pull where they're, um, it, it's physically difficult for them to breathe. And so I'm going to talk in a minute about a vigor assessment, which is a simple test to determine whether a calf has a high probability of doing okay on its own without any intervention, or whether we should do some procedures to make sure that calf gets a good start. We all know that uh, a calf that is born uh, by getting enough colostrum and has adequate immunity at birth, there is a lot of positive effects throughout that calf's life, both from health and production uh, parameters. When we do disease investigations and whether it's scouring uh, scour outbreaks like Lisa talked about, or whether it's pneumonia in newborn calves, oftentimes we get hung up in trying to determine that disease in that calf or that disease in that group of calves, but the overriding factor in all of them is the fact that there's a lot of failure of passive transfer in that herd because for whatever reason, there's a high percentage of calves that are not getting adequate colostrum at birth. So if we look some of the things that will affect uh, colostrum consumption, in Elizabeth's research, um, she looked at um, whether a calf had to be pulled or not and how that affected whether it nursed on its own or not. And so you can see in the bar at the left on calves that were born unassisted in her study, over 80% of those calves nursed on their own within a four hour time period of birth. And that's kind of the target time period we're looking for as far as colostrum consumption is. We want these calves to take in the uh, required amount of colostrum, and I'll talk about what the definition of that is in a minute, uh, within four hours of birth. And then as we work through easy and hard pulls, of course, what we wind up seeing is these calves are less viable as the dystocia became more difficult. And so in the hard pull group, um, less than 40% of those calves nursed on their own and, is, and a, a, a smaller percentage um, nursed on their own when the uh, cow was restrained in a head gate and another percentage would nurse when they were bottle fed but they didn't stand and do it on their own. And then of course we get into the group that was um, in most trouble and that is they had to be tube fed because they weren't capable of doing that on their own within four hours of birth. The other thing she looked at was how um, the, suckle respo the suckle reflex response related to nursing. And so what she saw was there was a strong correlation between calves that had a strong suckle reflex within 10 minutes of birth and calves that nursed on their own within four hours of birth. The calves at, at, at 10 minutes of birth, when, um, when she put her middle finger into their mouth and, and uh, massaged the roof of their mouth, the calves that didn't really latch onto her finger and didn't really suck on the finger like, it was a, a, like they were nursing, uh, they were uh, less likely to nurse on their own and they were much more likely to need bottle feeding or tube feeding in order to get colostrum into their system. So the take home message is that if a calf doesn't have a strong suckle reflex, he's 41 times less likely to consume colostrum on his own. So that is an important uh, message of my whole talk today is that you should always do a suckle reflex test on newborn calves. And if they do not have a strong suckle reflex at 10 minutes of age, then you should take, um, you should intervene and take methods to make sure that that calf is going to get colostrum. So I'm going to expand a little bit on Lisa's um, conversation earlier about colostrum management. So when we talk about colostrum and whether it's uh, artificial or natural cow colostrum, it's the immunoglobulin G that is the important part. And the amount of IgG in the product determines the amount of immunity that the calf receives when they ingest that. And so, as Lisa's already said, um, colostrum from your own herd is the best. Uh, a second choice would be the commercial products available. Um, we're reluctant to re re recommend dairy colostrum, partly because you need a higher volume to get the same amount of IgG because it's a more dilute product. And then, of course, um, there's always a the potential of introducing outside disease into your herd. And 
the uh, dairy population has a higher percentage of yonis uh, than the beef population, so that's a disease that potentially could be transmitted through the milk, and we uh, don't want that to be uh, transmitted to any of our herds. So you can store it for a year. Um, you can only, when you thaw it, you can only thaw it once. You can't refreeze it. As mentioned, don't microwave it. Thaw it out in a hot water bath. Um, generally speaking, we believe that calves need two liters of good quality colostrum. If it's a small calf, you may not be able to do that in one feeding. You may have to split it into two one liter feedings. And if we look at the bar graph here on the right hand side of our page, um, you'll see that cow colostrum has a much higher uh, concentration of ITG in it. And the magic number that we're looking for in um, for um, adequate immunity in colostrum intake is, is 100 grams of IgG. And so the probability of getting um, 100 grams in a two liter um, sample of cow's colostrum is much higher. So we do recommend that people, if they're gonna use their own herd's colostrum, that they use a colostrum from cows. And so again, as discussed earlier, there's supplement products, there's replacer products. The replacer products, in general, one two liter feeding gives you all of the colostrum you need, which is 100 grams of IgG or more. The lower products, um, you either need multiple bags to get the 100 gram total, or um, you can make, um, if the calf has nursed some, or if you've got some of your own uh, saved cow colostrum. And make sure that you mix the uh, commercial products as per uh, label directions. So when we talk about how we're going to supplement colostrum in the calf, uh, the nursing the nursing the nam is always best. So everything we do other than that is uh, is a is a second rate. We also know that bottle feeding is better than tube feeding, and the reason for that is when the calf nurses, uh, there's a anatomical feature in the gastrointestinal tract called the esophageal groove that shunts the uh, product from the esophagus through the other stomachs right into the fourth stomach, which is the abomasum. And in newborn calves, the abomasum is the functional stomach and it's the one that absorbs the milk. If we tube feed the calf and there's no suckling in the intake of the product, then we actually have to give them more product so that we overflow the uh, rumen and into the and the omasum into the abomasum, and so um, so that the milk actually gets to where it's absorbed in the calf. So bottle feeding is better than tube feeding, but nothing beats a calf that nurses. So my take home messages today is that make sure that if when you're resuscitating calves, you do it in sternal. Don't hang them over a fence. Assessing the suckle reflex within 10 minutes of birth is the single most important thing you can do to a calf to decide whether it needs help or not as far as taking in colostrum. If you don't feel that you're getting a strong suckle reflex, then you should uh, intervene and uh, take methods to make sure that calf gets the colostrum. And whether that's um, helping it nurse on its own, whether that's bottle feeding it or whether that's tube feeding it, there's different ways to get to the um, required end result. So with that, thank you very much. And Stacy, back to you. All right, thank you very much, Craig. Um, with that, I will introduce our last speaker of the night, Dr. Roy Lewis. He graduated from WCBM in 1981 and was a partner at the Westlock Veterinary Clinic until January of 2013. His interests are preventative medicine, fertility, as well as animal welfare. Roy joined Merck Animal Health in 2012 as a technical services veterinarian part-time. Roy is also part of their family-owned purebred Semental and Angus cattle, grain, and potato mix farming operation near Spruce Grove, Alberta. Well, uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, hopefully uh, uh, this, uh, this last presentation will add more into what the others. I'm going to be talking more about the next generation of calves, so uh, I'm going to be talking about um, breeding soundness exams, but more really specifically because of the time allowed um, penile problems that we see in yearling bulls, and probably to more reiterate that 
on, on breeding soundness exams where it's always been talked about the semen quality and that sort of thing. Uh, there's other things that we find as veterinarians when we examine these bulls um, that a lot of which we can actually uh, uh, treat and cure at that time and, uh, and, and make a functional bull for the, for the purebred breeder. So I would, I'd, I would instill in everybody to buy uh, semen tested and uh, breeding soundness exam bulls and, um, and closely look at the semen forms. So when you get them for the evidence that they may have even had these problems, which is fine, uh, as long as it's identified on there and, uh, and they've been corrected uh, before they're sold. So next slide, Stacy. The, uh, the, um, the bull being half the genetics of the, of the herd and the cow, the other half, that's why by concentrating on uh, uh, when you purchase these bulls, uh, again, that, that leads into your calf crop for the next year, and it's a sound investment to make, and a lot of the, uh, virtually all the purebred breeders that I've worked with, and I know lots in the West, uh, primarily uh, semen test all their bulls uh, before, they're, before they're sold. Uh, next slide. So the, on the breeding soundness exam, again, the, the components, uh, we as veterinarians really can't, uh, uh, in Australia, do some libido testing uh, and stanchions and that sort of thing, but that's more up to you, the individual owner, to, to ensure that's happening uh, when, uh, when you purchase these bulls and turn them out. So it's really good, especially with the, the young yearling bulls to uh, make sure that they can adequately breed and they don't have some, some issues with that. Um, whether, uh, whether it's a coordination thing or, or back issues, that sort of thing that may be detected uh, when you're watching them breed. If they, some seem to be very awkward, they'll mount the head of the cow rather than the back. So you want to identify all those things before you just turn them out uh, without, without checking that uh, into the herd. The other thing is, of course, all the physical soundness things that we look at, feet and legs. Uh, this shows a picture of a, a pretty old uh, uh, old type of uh, Simmental bull, but one that was really posty legged, so really had some issues with the back back uh, legs. And again, all these things are, are looked at uh, during the breeding soundness exam. Next slide. The semen quality, again, we always talk about that, the defects that we're looking for, uh, bulls that have greater than 70% normal sperm. And again, I'm not going to get into all the different defects uh, that we see today. Some are probably worse than others. Some do clear up with time on these young yearling bulls. So uh, a lot of times they may be retested uh, when they're a little bit older because a lot of the sales for the yearling bulls are typically, in, the vast majority are in March and these bulls are usually in that 13 month range and, and lots will happen between 12 and 15 months as far as semen quality goes, usually, usually on the improving uh, side of things. The little pictures on the on that chart there, though, show um, basically uh, the peanut problems, which I'm really going to get into here next. And that being, uh, you see a picture of a um, a normal uh, normal penis, uh, then one with a frenulum or a ligamentous attachment. I'll get into those. Uh, hair rings, and then sort of gross, or what 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 were co most common uh, gross are uh, 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 penile warts um, and should be mentioned that if you have a lot of warts on the outside of the body of a bull that doesn't necessarily mean they have penile warts they're apparently caused by a slightly different uh, papova virus and so uh, I've done herds where we've run into lots of warts in some years and none in others and the bulls themselves did not have any external warts so really something that's hard to tell until the uh, until they're examined under a breeding soundness exam, we can get the uh, penis to protrude and have a look at it. So next slide will show a um, uh, penis with one of those uh, very bad frenulums on it. And so what happens when the bull gets erect is that penis is bent around. And I firmly believe that some bulls that aren't checked and have these when they go into the breeding season, that, that can lead to broken penises and or um, lacerations on it, that sort of thing, because you can Im very well imagine that bull trying to breed a cow will uh, impact on the back end of the cow and 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 you know could severely damage the penis. So uh, and or rip, um, and if the uh, frenulum rips, um, it, you know will heal. But 
if that's happened right at the beginning of the breeding season when they're breeding every day or several times a day, that bleeding will continue. And of course, bleeding is uh, spermicidal or definitely very harmful to the sperm. And so that can run into fertility problems alone. If we can identify these early when we test, we can do surgery on them, which just involves nipping the, uh, the ligament. Um, uh, they, can, they can recover and go on to, uh, to be healthy, uh, healthy, productive bulls. Next slide just shows um, one that I was just getting ready to, to kind of nip that uh, ligamentous attachment there. Um, keep in mind, this is usually a heritable disease, but, but a heritable condition, sorry, not disease, but it being a heritable condition, um, really not a concern to, in my eyes anyway for the commercial cattlemen. There's no, there's no female counterpart to this. So these bulls will sire normal heifers and really if it's a commercial operation where all the bull cows are, are not gonna go on for breeding, they're just gonna be commercial steers, steers that'll be fed out in the feedlot. There's really zero concern to commercial operators buying these things. I think as a purebred breeder though, uh, you'd want to again check the semen form if there was a frenulum that was cut on the on a bull uh, to to uh, render him fine to uh, to sell as a breeding bull. You'd want to avoid that as a purebred operator just because you don't want that showing up in your in your uh, purebred uh, bull calves. So the, and the worst case scenario I did uh, and I couldn't follow back on the herd sire, but we had a in my practice career, a actually small purebred breeder that had eight bull calves that we tested all out of the same sire and three of them had these frenulums. So that's usually in my incidents, I'm always good at throwing out sort of stats and numbers that is just what I've run into. But I would say in the, in the purebred yearling bulls, I probably see about one of these every hundred bulls or so. It's not a very common thing, but again, seeing it, correcting it, uh, we can we can render that bull fine for, for breeding. Next picture just shows, um, again, the surgery, which is, is basically just nipping that ligament uh, on the bad ones. We'll usually come back in two weeks and recheck them just to make sure everything's healed well and it hasn't reattached or there's not scarring down of the prep use to the, uh, the penis and that sort of thing. So just so, so that's evident. Next slide will show a Fibra papilloma award, and I think most veterinarians that do a fair amount of uh, breeding soundness exams definitely run into these. Uh, they either book them in for surgery later, do them then. I think it depends on the severity of the wart, uh, but there's a vast majority of them that can uh, can be be these these can be nipped off and do not reoccur. We can get down to the stock of them and uh, do a pretty good job either with surgical removal and or cryosurgery, that sort of thing, and, and, uh, and, and turn these things around. Um, next slide will reveal one that was, it seems quite um, large, and it's at the end of the, near the end of the penis, but at the same time, this one had a fairly well-defined stalk so that it could be removed. That one had to be sutured, I think, after we, because uh, it caused a little bit of a, an open wound there. Uh, but again, on the recheck, that thing came around. The next slide will show one that has um, quite a few small little individual warts that were taken off. And again, this, this one uh, ended up going on to be a sound breeder and, uh, and, and sire calves for many years. Uh, again, on the recheck, making sure these things don't reoccur. And just to let you know that they don't always uh, turn around the next slide, will show one that had quite uh, involved wart partway up the penis and also near the tip. Uh, this was attempted to be removed two or three times and just kept recurring and this bull had to be, this was quite a valuable uh, purebred bull, but he ended up having to, uh, to go to slaughter because we just couldn't, uh, couldn't cure. So again, it's just important to follow, uh, that the, uh, the purebred breeder would follow these up with his veterinarian to make sure that they're, they're gonna be curative uh, and then they can be very uh, confident in selling them as a, as a sound breeding bull as long as the other parameters of the breeding soundness exam are, are passed. Next slide will we'll show, uh, just, uh, just happen to have one with, it's got a lot of scrotal frostbite uh, in the winter. And again, young bulls, old bulls, I guess this is probably a little more common in herd sires. 
that have big testicles that hang down quite a bit and uh, they may start losing their ability to control temperature in them. But in my experience, and, and I'm sure the, hopefully the other veterinarians would concur on this, uh, I find it really hard to tell by just looking externally. I've, I've, I've semen tested bulls that have quite a, quite a, so I just had the phone in there. They had quite a bit of frostbite and yet semen tested okay. And others that have a little bit of nipping on there and it's, uh, uh, and it's rendered the bull uh, infertile. So again, the only way is to do it, to perform a breeding soundness exam to be sure. I uh, just wanted to show a couple of slides. The next two, Stacy, you can go through that show uh, just use use of the scrotal tape, um, and, and I, what I think's happened in my career, there's been several different scrotal tapes invented, and I think from one end of the country to the other, the veterinarians are pretty consistent in this. Generally, this is the reliable uh, bull tape, and the nice thing about it is um, uh, the the, uh, the the pressure is sort of regulated in a sense so that we can all be very close because I think that's another important thing is if, if these are measured you want them to be pretty close from one veterinarian to the to the next uh, going forward. Just a couple slides left uh, on um, on different uh, so the, the next one it will we'll show a corkscrew deviation that we see quite ra rarely but I think again there's probably more of these out in the country that the, the owners may notice, but some of them end up being broken penises too. I believe we see a lot more of them with uh, older bulls that are, are used heavily. And I think it's a fatigue thing near the end of the year. And, and sometimes uh, these can be surgically corrected or a lot of times they are just, uh, just shipped. Next slide will show up. Um, cut penises. So I just wanted to finish off with a couple penile injuries that we will commonly see in older bulls and maybe how to determine a little bit the difference uh, between the two and also the fact that um, the th this bull has a cut cut penis um, that led to swelling and periphimosis or the or the the, the it, it appears prolapsed um, and, and a lot of these if we can uh, treat them with hydrotherapy, keep them in the shade so they don't get uh, dried out and, and cracked and that sort of thing. They will gradually reduce so that we can get them inside the, the bull sheath. And then it's a time factor to see whether they will come along and heal. And there's a vast majority of them, if they're not cut too badly, will. I mean, they usually need, you know, at least minimum two weeks rest and probably longer. So if it's found near the end of the breeding season, uh, you've got a fair bit of time on some of these valuable bulls to uh, get them to heal up and, and check the next year uh, to see if, uh, if, if they can be used. We all know that there, this happens probably a lot more than we even notice out in, in our pastures just because of the fact that a lot of the, the uh, not a lot, but there's probably a 10 to 20 percent a range of some of these herd sires that have big scars on them so they have cut their penises and other years healed up nobody even knew the difference uh, and at semen testing all we do is see the scar and yet they're uh, perfectly functional uh, perfectly uh, capable of, of getting an erection um, and, uh, and and going through a normal normal breeding process so the next slide on the prepucial injury um, you will see uh, swelling on the on the prep use, but lower down, you see the scrotum there, head of the scrotum looks fairly normal, and then distally uh, towards uh, the prepuce that looks swollen, that bull will definitely have a cut cut penis or cut prepuce in, in, on the inside. And again, uh, with, with treatment, a pretty good chance uh, that that bull may come around and, uh, and go on to uh, sire and func functional, uh, functionally breed the following breeding season. Uh, the, the next slide stays on the penile injury and a penile hematoma. Um, that's where the penis will break, uh, essentially, and the uh, blood engorged part will leak out to the outside. And, of course, the longer they're left or not found in the pasture, if they're a fairly aggressive breeder with good libido, will keep attempting to breed and get more and more blood in there. And they usually get to the stage of, uh, of, of getting quite, quite large and, and usually are a shipping candidate. I know some breeders that have found them early uh, have rested them and 
you know, I want to say there's a 50% chance they may, uh, they may heal spontaneously, but a lot of them scar up, uh, and there's not very much we can, we can do about those. But the prepucial cuts, uh, we, you know, again, a very good prognosis. Next slide just shows one on a Hereford bull that, you know, probably wasn't found at pasture uh, for a little while, and so that swelling will get extremely large. I've only got one other slide before my uh, uh, question slide at the end, but uh, so the next slide just shows, and it, it's kind of an animated one you can click through, but uh, I think more so in the US and in Canada, I believe, uh, I, I don't know the situation in the East very well, but in Western Canada, the vast majority of the herds are vaccinated for uh, BVD, and I know, uh, all the, all the uh, top end purebred herds would be for sure. So w what they're trying to do as well is that's assuring that the, the herd sires that you buy are, are not persistently infected animals from, from calves from developing uh, BVD in utero. Uh, if there's any question about that, those, the, the, uh, the bulls can be tested and some breeders do do that. Uh, and I was just seeing the other day that the Denver Bull Show our Denver uh, cattle show wants animals all BVD tested going in. So that the whole reason is trying to prevent those from uh, spreading that uh, persistent uh, infection in the herd. Rarely would we see that in, in purebred bulls, but it's always a possibility. And sometimes they're, they're fairly well doing animals, surprisingly enough. So uh, the next slide is just the question slide of my uh, cow with a big question mark on her head. And I'd, I'll change change it back to you Stacy and uh, thank you for listening Oh, sorry about that. I was talking away and I was still muted. Um, so we'll open it up to questions now. So if I can get all of our presenters to turn on your webcams and um, off your mute. And we will open it up to questions. If you have any questions, type them in the Q&A box on the top of your screen. We do have some coming in already. So um, I'll start with that. Um, this first one here. Um, assuming it's for Lisa, what are your thoughts about the use of commercially available immune stimulants on scours? So commercially available immune stimulants, and I see someone mentioned Amplimmune. Um, for anyone that doesn't know, the basic premise behind these products is to try and stimulate the calf's immune system so that hopefully they're better able to fight off um, the E. coli K99 is the one that Amplimune kind of fights off in hopes that you do not have to treat that calf with antibiotics. So in a world where we're trying to decrease antibiotic resistance, decrease the amount of antibiotics that are used in our animals, um, a lot of people are trying products like Amplimune to try and decrease what they're using on their farm. Um, and there have been some people that are very, very pleased with those products. So if you have done the testing and found out that maybe E. coli is the main problem on your farm, um, it's definitely a viable option to discuss with your vet. All right. Um, and a second one for Lisa here. What vaccines are available for newborn calves? And is there a risk of interaction with clostridial antibodies from passive immunity? So there's several different uh, products that are available for newborn calves. Some of them come in pill form, some of them come in paste form, some of them come um, as a liquid and a powder that you have to mix together. Um, they are specifically designed to give to newborn calves so that they do not have 
interference from any antibodies that you receive through colostrum. Um, so basically they're trying to boost that calf's immune system in addition to what they're already getting from colostrum. So that's the way they're specifically designed to be used in newborn calves and they're basically only boosting what they're getting from their mother already. Okay. I'm going to direct this one at Mac here. Is there a difference between foot rot in cows that have been out on the pasture and those that are in a feedlot? That's a good question. Um, I, there is a couple of bugs that can, a couple of bacteria that can cause what is called classic foot rot or pasture foot rot, but it's essentially there's a crack in the skin between the toes. The bacteria then gets in the in the uh, tissues of the foot and causes a very large, swollen, painful foot. Um, and if it is if it is a simple foot rot, uh, many many antibiotics should work on it, whether it be tetracycline or penicillin. Um, even uh, ceftiofura would work on it. Um, so we do treat, we do see feedlot cattle with foot rot. What is it is exactly the same bacteria? I'm not sure, um, but for all intents and purposes, yes, it is the same disease. Uh, it's caused the same way and you treat it the same way. For Craig, could you please explain again how, the suck, how to test for the suckle reflex? Uh, so, the uh, your audio is a little bit um, muted there, but you want me to describe the suckle reflex test again? And so yeah, please. we do this within or at about 10 minutes of after birth. And you just what you're trying to do is take your finger and mimic a cow's teeth. And so you take your middle finger and insert it into the calf's mouth above the tongue. And then you rub the finger along the roof of the mouth. And in a, a normal calf with a strong suckle reflex, they will start sucking on your finger as if they were nursing a teat. And you should actually feel the negative pressure on your finger, and you should actually feel the blood being drawn to the tip of your finger. And if there is a limp response or no response, then that calf would fall into the category of needing intervention as far as uh, colostrum. Okay. For Roy here, um, what is the main cause of a cut penis? Uh, a lot of times it's, uh, it's them, attempt, you know, we, we thought it was attempting to, to breed and catching something uh, is, is a possibility. I think a lot of it's bending uh, right when they, when they enter the cow and then you can get a, a bit of ripping that way. Um, the, the bulls that are a little more aggressive breeders obviously have a little more propensity to have injuries and that sort of thing. So that's, that's really the cause. Okay. Um, for Lisa here, how much milk does a normal calf drink in a day? So if they're scouring, how much electrolytes and milk should it get if it isn't sucking the cow but has scours? So a little bit of it depends on the size of the calf. Obviously, if you have a calf that's a 50 pound calf, it might drink a little bit different amount than what a 100 pound calf would. Um, but as a general rule, they probably drink between nine and 12 liters a day. Um, so if you have a calf that is scouring, but still nursing, generally I try and get people to replace about a quarter of what they would normally drink. So if you think they normally drink 10 liters a day or 12 liters a day, you're going to try and replace um, two or three liters with electrolytes. Uh, if a calf is to the point of not nursing its mother, then you're going to want to try and add half of what it would normally drink in electrolytes. So that would be five or six liters split up over several feedings, obviously, in addition to what it is already drinking. So the worse the scours are, the less that it's drinking from its mother, the more you're going to have to supplement. Okay. Thank you. Um, for Matt, this is a question about the case you were talking about with the Herford cows with pink eye. Somebody was asking about their vaccination protocol because they found that when they started using 
intranasal IVR vaccines, pink eye on their operation essentially disappeared. So do you have any comments about that? Uh, yes, they have a very, they've got a very good um, vaccination, like a non, we'll call it a non pink eye vaccination protocol. The, uh, the newborn calves are given an intranasal, three-way intranasal vaccine. And, um, and then they are also given in the fall, they are given the, a five-way viral vaccine uh, with the pastorella component. Um, so yes, it is a, uh, it is a well-vaccinated herd, um, which is sort of uh, why we are uh, baffled with it. And hopefully we can uh, figure out why. Um, and, we're, and we're doing so right now. We're, we're in, the, in the process of doing that now. But yeah, they are well vaccinated. Um, and now I guess that sort of led me to the belief, what led me to the question of, of why are we giving these pink eye vaccines uh, in the neck? Should, should they be intranasal or should they be some other route? Um, but intranasal is the one that we were thinking of as well. Um, I think it was Craig that talked about heifer colostrum versus cow colostrum. Um, should we give calves that are born from heifers extra colostrum? Um, calves born from heifers are more likely to have failure of passive transfer, which is the medical term for um, not enough immunity in the colostrum that they took in in the first 36 hours of life. And so that's a, it's difficult to make a blanket statement on that. Um, I would suggest that if your heifers look like they've got adequate milk, and most of the time that would be just by the size of their udder and whether the calves look like they're um, um, full after nursing and whatnot, then they don't need to. Um, so it's a little bit difficult by just looking at a heifer to determine whether that animal is giving it up or not. And so um, it, it, it's not easy to give a, a, a simple answer to that. So I, I would use that suckle reflex as, an, as, a, um, a, as a standard of whether the calf is able to nurse the cow adequately on its own. And then you'll just have to use um, udder size and, and calf um, um, status to determine that. But of course, because the hef because the newborn calf needs that colostrum uh, very early in its life, you don't have time to wait and, and see on an individual basis whether that's going to work. So I don't know if I've answered that question adequately uh, because it's not a simple answer. Okay. Um, another question for you, Craig. Is there ever a time when it is appropriate to hang a calf upside down? They're asking about in the case of C-sections, for example, or should they be using the other techniques that you were mentioning? <laughs> use the other technique and uh, so use the sternal technique and Roy can probably he's probably chuckling because we both graduated in an area we hung every calf over a fence whether they pulled out the back end or came out of a cesarean section surgery site um, but we know now that that was a mistake would you agree with that Roy yeah absolutely and it seemed to me the farmers, their gate was always seven feet high, right? So it's, uh, yes, that, that is a big improvement. You yeah, so, so if, if you, you know, in, in a lot of clinics, they have a, a pulley system to pull the calf out, but that's for pulling the calf out. That's not for hanging the calf up after it's out of the cow. Okay. Um. So somebody's asking about, apparently in North Dakota, they're seeing ovine pink eye and beef cattle. Um, has this happened in Canada? Are any of you aware? I didn't see. I, I mean, they've cultured bacteria, sheep specific bacteria in cattle. Is that the, is that, am I correct? I think so, yes. I haven't, I have not cultured any. Um, I'll just speak to that and we've had similar pink eye outbreak problems in Alberta as to what Mac has described in Ontario and it's equally as frustrating here as it is there Mac. Um, and there's been a fair amount of investigative work on etiology or what is exactly the bug causing it and I've not heard of ovine being one of those uh, problems. Uh, question for Roy here. 
if a cow has been previously vaccinated for BVD or that their vaccine status is unknown, is it still possible to test for BVD? And if so, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, well, the, the big test is for a, this PI status. So if they've, if they've had it, um, yeah, you can do, uh, you can, well, I guess you could, if you, you're not sure, you can just go ahead and vaccinate again. But the, but the thing is, if you're, if you're worried about that, yeah, we, we take a ear notch. So we take a bit of tissue and they can be pooled if there's a bunch of, a bunch of them to do. Uh, Cause that's the big thing is finding out if it's a persistently infected animal. And uh, so skin will do that. So the ear, ear notch is kind of the, the way to go. Okay. Um, Lisa, you mentioned a liter a day per calf. So they're asking about a calf born from a hard pole and they're drinking twice a day and thriving fine with no scours. Should they be increasing um, the amount of milk they're getting if they don't think they're getting that liter a day from the cow, I assume? So I do find uh, a lot of times if people are having to supplement uh, a calf, um, whether it's with milk or with milk replacer, uh, if they're having to bottle feed it, a lot of times the calves are not getting enough. And while the calf is younger, you might not notice that because they seem to be doing okay, but as they grow, they would definitely fall behind their counterparts. And for the most part, I find it's that people are not feeding enough throughout the day. So despite the fact that you are um, trying to replace what mom is doing, that means that you have to feed several feedings through a, throughout the day, which is hard when people have other jobs or you know they're not necessarily there all the time. But you still need to supplement that nine to 12 liters a day for that calf. And that means that you have to split that up over three or four feedings oftentimes. So uh, if you're not feeding quite that much, then over time you'll probably notice that your calves are lagging behind the ones that are just freely nursing off their mothers. Okay, so there are more questions coming in here. Um, I've got a couple more here and I think we're gonna cut it off after that. Um, but I have one for Craig here. How far do you place the needle into the calf septum? Uh, three quarters. Well, I use a one inch needle and I put it not quite all the way in. So that would be about uh, three quarters of an inch. And you don't need a large diameter needle. So a, a 22 or a 20 gauge needle is enough. Okay. Um, and one more here, and whoever wants to take a crack at answering this, um, ringworm wasn't covered on the webinar, but they're asking, um, saying it's more of a problem than usual this year. Does that mean my animals are lacking something? Anybody have any thoughts on ringworm? Well, we, we used to always worry about health of the, uh, health of the skin and vitamin A potentially. Um, you know, in the winter, lack of sun will, will, I mean, we always see ringworm clearing up in the, in the springtime typically. Uh, so it's always worse of a problem in the, in the winter. And if this has been a new problem, they may have had a, brought in something that's exposed to, I see it a lot of times in uh, really closed herds. And then all of a sudden, even the cows will be getting ringworm, I guess has been my, by my experience, but I'll let the others comment as well. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think, you know, vitamin A has been um, extensive and in short supply in the last few years. So I would wonder if some producers are, uh, are, or don't have adequate vitamin A in their uh, mineral supplements. Um, but in, in our world, unless it's show cattle or, or export cattle or something, um, we let Mother Nature take care of it and it will go away on its own. Um, so then the last question I have here is for all of you, I'll get you all to answer this. Um, because you are working with a lot of different, different operations, what would be one thing that you generally see people aren't aware of that could improve their operation as a whole? So kind of a bigger picture question, but um, you know, one area that you feel like producers could um, benefit from learning more about. Maybe I'll start with you, Lisa. 
Um, I think I think one pe one portion that I find people maybe don't use to their advantage is they look at vets as an extra cost to their operation, and they maybe don't use us to the best advantage. Um, you know, we we can answer a lot of questions and work with them to try and solve a lot of problems. And sometimes, you know, albeit that that might cost them a little bit of money, but it might save them a lot in the end. So I know, you know, a lot of people try and have us to their operations as least as they possibly can. But sometimes spending a little bit of money in one area could save you calves, could mean that your cattle gain better, could mean that you're making money at the other end um, if you just spent a little bit of money in the beginning. So that's one thing that I think people could maybe take advantage of more often. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, Mac, what are your thoughts? Uh, I, I would agree 100% with what Lisa said. I think we had, uh, years ago, we had a, a producer that had, uh, um, coincidentally, a, a purebred Hereford herd as well, and he had a horrendous scour outbreak. Um, so we got things righted, et cetera, and, and the very next year, and we started vaccinating uh, the cows that hadn't calved yet. Um, but for the following year, um, we had everything lined up, and everything was vaccinated when it was supposed to be, and uh, he had no scours whatsoever. Uh, the following year, and you know, it's the whole old saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, so when Lisa's has talked about it and, and Craig has talked about it, and, and cleanliness is the most important, and my, my uh, sort of my take-home message for scours and prevention is vaccinate the cows with the scour vaccine and vaccinate the calves with straw. Lisa showed you that beautiful picture of a calf with straw up to its ears, and that's what they should you should aim for um, because everything that they, you know, they're just like babies. Everything that they want in their mouth goes in their mouth. And, and if it's manure, they're going to get diarrhea. Um, as far as uh, how can you improve yourself, your, your own, uh, your own operation, I, I think record keeping is very important. And I don't think, uh, I don't think even large, uh, farms keep as good a records as they could, um, especially the, the small farms are probably more at risk of not keeping uh, accurate records. Um, but sit down with your veterinarian um, and uh, come up with a preventative uh, health program that um, you know may not be the same as your neighbors, depending on what your disease pressures are, but. Sit down with your veterinarian, come up with a preventative program, and uh, make sure you stick to it. And then record things and see how things go, and then tweak things as you need to. Um, uh, I use a, a, you know, you've got to use professionals. I, I think uh, when you spend money wisely, it, it ends up paying dividends. And you know, I, you, whether you use a, a chartered accountant for your taxes or or uh, your buddy from high school who, who thinks he can do it. it I think you're gonna you're gonna spend more money with a chartered accountant, but you'll save more in the end. All right, Craig, what are your thoughts? Two quick thoughts, and one is just to reiterate what Max said. Um, I think the 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 thing producers don't do enough is make an appointment with their vet to once a year review their annual health and production program, and so it's too often that we are preg checking cows and the person looking at what they're vaccinating with and thinking, Ooh, I wish you to talk to me about that because we've changed to a different program now, or um, they're in the middle of a scour wreck and you think, man, if I could have given you this advice four months ago, we could have prevented it. So it's difficult to get good advice from a veterinarian when he's actually working at the same time because you're both busy and all occupied with other things. So make an appointment along what Mac has already said, dedicated to reviewing your program on an annual basis. My second thought here is uh, third trimester nutrition. Um, I think the trace mineral supplementation and proper energy and protein needs and making sure that that cow goes into 
um, the calving season in the proper body condition and with the proper uh, nutrients in her system is critical for both her and the calf. Okay, thanks Craig. And Roy? Yeah, well, I'm going to definitely agree with the, the three ahead of me. And then kind of it was interesting, I was jotting down a couple points I thought I was going to say, and they've kind of, kind of uh, talked on them here. But, uh, yeah, I think you know, relating to what Max said, can't, you know, you can't, can't improve what you can't, can't measure. So, I mean, the record keeping sure goes a long way to, uh, to looking after that. And I wanted to – I guess the other thing, uh, again, using the, the professionals that can – bring them up to date on vaccination protocols. I always like to get away from the coffee room talk with all the neighbors and the, you know, the magic bullet cures that are out there that really aren't uh, with prudent use of antimicrobials and stuff uh, and our crackdown on them. I think it's going to go to that in the future is more vaccinations to try to keep that along with good management. So we've, we've all talked on uh, different subjects on that as well. And that, that would be my advice. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to answer all of those questions for all of you. And I think, you know, if anybody has any more questions, I think um, we would encourage you to talk with your veterinarian. I think that was one of the main things that came out of the, that final question there. So before we let everybody go here, I just have a few more things. Um, the first one is how to get more science-based production advice through our website, beefresearch.ca. Um, if you go to our website, you can hit subscribe, you can join our blog, and you will get email notifications um, when we publish new material. Um, if you have a Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube account, you can connect with us there as well. Our next webinar will be happening on February 12th. We're going to be talking about adaptive grazing and grazing resources, so be sure to join us for that. Um, you're going to be receiving an email from Ellen within the next couple of days with a link to watch this recording as well as some supplemental information and a link to complete a survey. We ask that you do complete that survey. Um, it really helps us come up with topics for future webinars and make sure that they're really relevant and useful to you on your operation. So that's it. Um, I want to thank all of you at home for joining us tonight. And on behalf of everybody, I would like to thank um, all of our veterinarians, Lisa, Matt, Craig, and Roy for volunteering your time and expertise tonight. Good night.